We're very pleased today to welcome Judge Doug McCullough. He is going to be talking to us about his new book, Sea of Greed, the true story of the largest drug bust in the history of the United States. Judge McCullough is currently at the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Prior to that, he spent 30 plus years in law, serving on both sides of the bench. During the 1980s, he was a federal prosecutor in Raleigh, back when drug smuggling off the North Carolina coast was at its height. The book Sea of Greed is the account of the drug seizures that eventually led to the takedown of Panama's notorious dictator, Manuel Noriega. So please welcome Judge Doug McCullough. For those of you who were living here in the <clears throat> 1980s, you may recall that uh, the Attorney General's office posted a picture of a shrimp boat trawler uh, plying the intercoastal waterways as a wanted poster. And they wanted information about who was smuggling and where the smuggling was taking place and, and whatnot. And if anybody went in the post office during that era, you probably saw that uh, posted. And that coincided with the time I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office as a federal prosecutor. Uh, I will say that this story is, uh, I've got to give credit from, to my wife here. I knew this story was a good story. I always thought it was a good story. I started on it a couple of times. We were getting ready to move uh, first to uh, Holly Springs and then out to Atlantic Beach. And she saw this box of materials with all the investigative materials and everything. And she said, what are you going to do with this? And uh, needless to say, beside it, behind every successful man, there is a good woman, and, and this is the result, sea of, sea of Greed, which we have uh, come up with. I'll tell the story about uh, how it started. Uh, Manuel Noriega was uh, in command of Panama. He had taken control of it. Uh, the people that started off in North Carolina did not necessarily know Noriega at the beginning. They were kind of driven to that. And what happened is this boat right here, which was actually called the Lady Marset, it has a false name on the stern, the Bobby M. of Wilmington, uh, was stopped by two Coast Guardsmen uh, on July the 7th, 1982. These two Coasties were uh, out to make sure that the sailboaters had unrafted from their floating cocktail party they had head towards sundown and had left the shipping lanes clear when they saw two lights coming in Shackleford Banks and they were out of the channel, so they go to uh, render assistance before they have a grounding. Uh, the first boat they found at the beginning of, at the entranceway to Taylor's Creek in Beaufort, and remember this is the era of uh, Saturday Night Fever, they had a Colombian on board and stacked heels, silk shirt, and gold chains, obviously out of place <laughs> in our neck of the woods. And uh, they got the runaround from these fellows, but by that time they had realized another boat had been following that boat, and it had gone by, and they wanted to check it out because it was much larger, and it was this one. They had some conversation with the... Uh, Captain uh, realized he was not really a shrimper. Uh, first of all, one of the Coast Guardsmen happened to be from Wilmington. And note that Wilmington is not a place where the shrimp boats are based in North Carolina. It's too far from the inlet. Out by Carolina Beach you might find some shrimpers, but not in Wilmington. And then he didn't know anybody in the Wilmington waterfront community with whom this Coast Guardsman was uh, familiar. So one of the men boarded the boat realized that this was out of the ordinary because of the electronics on board, heard a shotgun make that distinctive chunk as it wrapped around to his rear, where he would have no opportunity to, to do anything if he uh, tried to be a hero. So he acted as if he had heard nothing, backed away. Day when we don't have cell phones, they had to go find a landline and call for support. By the time they got back, they found the boat uh, empty with 29,000 pounds on board. Um, I was placed in charge of the investigation as the first assistant in the U.S. Attorney's Office. We got a lot of clues out of that, but for four and a half years, thereabouts, we didn't really have anybody we could indict. Um, whoops, a little faster than I wanted there. Our investigation found out that it had been financed by this man, Doc McGee. He was the financier. He was a drug smuggler from Florida and the Gulf Coast. Uh, he stepped into the legitimate world about the time we got on to him and was the manager of Bon Jovi and Motley Crue at the time that I indicted him. 
I'm on record in that and quoted in that magazine as saying he ought to go to jail. Some of you who were living here at the time may remember that Judge Britt decided, the federal Judge Britt, uh, decided that he should uh, give three anti-drug rock concerts as a way of turning this country around on the, on the issue of uh, drugs. We know how that worked out. <laughs> He may be. He managed Bon Jovi, Motley Crue. Uh, he has gone on, and they have split, as people in Hollywood tend to do. He was then managing Kiss, and I frankly don't know who he's involved with, but I know he's in, still in that milieu. Uh, it turned out that the, the money was used by these two characters, with one, plus one other man from Detroit named Michael Vogel. The one in the, uh, in the suit and tie in custody is Stephen Kalish. He was a high school marijuana seller from Houston. Uh, Lee Rich was pretty much a playboy from the Grand Caymans. They got together and had a very sophisticated organization. Their missions were planned by Navy SEAL uh, using military planning. They had radio silence. They had protective fans flown by airplanes uh, uh, driven by off-duty airline pilots who would go down the islands, rent a plane, and fly out to make sure there were no naval patrols that would interdict them. The only thing they didn't know was that at North Carolina in July, it's shrimp season. Not a good time to come in. Marine Fisheries Board and every, everybody makes sure they pay their license fees. <laughs> this is a picture of the offload site. As you can see, for miles, you can see on either, back in that day, you could see on either side of the, of the intercoastal waterway in an area called Adams Creek by the locals uh, that that this was pretty rugged territory. It was much like it was in the 1700s when Blackbeard would come down there. Uh, and we've had smugglers and pirates along our coast for a long time. I'm happy to say with modern progress, we can't do that anymore because on the other side now, there's about $40 million houses overlooking the intercoastal waterway. And somebody would be walking their dog at 2 o'clock in the morning and wondering what all those men are doing chunking bales out of a fish, fishing boat into some waiting trucks that were just behind that. The land is owned by Weyerhaeuser, it's still owned by Weyerhaeuser. Um, Weyerhaeuser took some profits on the land they owned on the other side and sold off the housing, housing lots. But they had a uh, fish camp in there. The fish camp was managed by a custodian who was the mayor of Atlantic Beach. And he also got prosecuted in this. Um, the drug, this was the only load that was ever interdicted by uh, law enforcement. This group did another load right there in November of 1982 successfully uh, and did uh, 39,000 pounds that day. They did an ocean going barge up the Mississippi River uh, which uh, landed north of uh, Louisiana and Lafayette. They had 550,000 pounds that they took off the boat. They had 30,000 pounds of wet left in the scuppers. That made them a hundred million dollars in one fell swoop per man uh, for, the, for the three triumvirate leaders. The salary schedule, uh, you would probably find pretty, pretty good work. Um, low penalties at that time. The maximum penalty for importation was uh, usually a five-year jail sentence. So you can decide whether you would take, take a risk. For $15,000, you could chunk bales. That's just take the bale from the boat to the truck. For $25,000, you could drive the truck. For $50,000, you could be a crew member. For $250,000, you could be the boat captain. A lookout also got fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, depending on uh, what was uh, used. And the security man and the bookkeeper got uh, a half a million dollars each, and then the rest of the profits went to the top. And like I said, those guys got a hundred million dollars, and that's where the, the need to go somewhere with that money uh, stemmed. They had a just like in the movie Blow. If anybody saw that, they had a house in Tampa, so loaded with money. You couldn't walk in it without a mask because money in that close to confined is toxic. Uh, they burned out two money counters that we, that we found. They made uh, contact with a Cuban in Miami. Everybody's, what's Jimmy Buffett's song? Everybody's got a cousin in Miami. Uh, and he knew how to get to uh, Noriega. Uh, Stephen Kalish went in. He presented the uh, general with a briefcase of about $300,000 in it at that time as an initial payment. And they laundered the money into Panama using the BCCI, a bank that got notoriety later on in its own right. Uh, Noriega was at the time being utilized by DEA and CIA. They had a saying at the time in the intelligence community, and Noriega is a man that can't be bought, but he can be rented from time to time. <laughs> and uh, they, at the higher levels of DEA and CIA, they were content 
to rent him and didn't really want this story to come out uh, about Noriega being dirty and drugs. Uh, the witnesses that I flipped, I took them to Camp Lejeune, got the provost marshal to provide us a little security so we could have a little heart-to-heart -heart talk about the war on drugs and why Mr. Kalich needed to tell us everything uh, about uh, Noriega. He flew Noriega to his meeting with President Reagan in, 19, in the mid-1980s uh, when he came up to visit him on, on Kalich's plane. Supposedly our intelligence agents didn't know that. A uh, drug smuggler was flying, uh, flying Noriega around. He then flew him out to uh, Las Vegas, my wife's hometown, for partying with showgirls uh, after the meeting with uh, Reagan was over before flying him back. Uh, Kalish had a very close relationship with Noriega and other members of the uh, Panamanian military and um, actually bought a condo in downtown Panama City, which was frequented by them as an after work place. They'd drop in, have drinks, he'd have hors d'oeuvres out, and things of that nature, and, and was really in the uh, political uh, high life of uh, that community. Uh, I put that in because my wife's from Vegas and that's where Noriega went. <laughs> um, that's uh, Ned Timmons, the guy who really kind of cracked the case for us in a way. Uh, greed is what broke him apart, hence the name Sea of Greed. It was waterborne and then greed. One of the uh, fellows was a uh, security specialist for the group. He, was, he and his brothers were actually enforcer for Hoffa in Detroit. They, uh, uh, the security guy would vet everybody and say, this guy's unreliable, don't use him, this guy's okay. And he had a little machine called a voice stress analysis machine that, you know, is uh, hocus pocus. And, uh, but they believed in him. And uh, if he said the guy couldn't work for him, they threw him out and wouldn't, wouldn't hire him. But if he said he's okay, they used him as an offloader, truck driver, whatever uh, capacity he was being used in. Uh, his nickname was Shine. Shine was supposed to keep the barge from coming in when it did because the guy in Detroit who had all the customers had airplane loads coming in at the same time and he knew that barge was actually going to depress the price of marijuana on the market. They knew supply and demand and um, <laughs> that this was going to cost him money. Now he was in on the barge also but he, this was a separate load and he got mad when Shine didn't do as he ordered him to do and the barge came in because the barge had to come in. It couldn't stop. They, you know, it, it was something that was beyond Shine's control. Anyway, he had Shine shot, uh, but he lived. And Shine's brothers brought this man in the white, uh, Ned Timmons. Uh, that was taken on the day we went looking for the offload site to take photographs uh, there in, in uh, Moorhead City. But uh, Timmons went undercover and uh, went into the Grand Caymans and gathered the evidence that with Shine's testimony and his corroboration, we finally had a case, and it started coming together. The reason this is considered the largest drug bust is um, when you put the airplane loads together, uh, there were about two dozen of those. There was five or six cocaine smuggling ventures that they had gotten into. The load up the Mississippi River, we indicted somewhere between five and 700 people. I've forgotten the exact count of all of the people who were involved in the same group and conspiracy. And I don't believe that there's been a uh, body count that has gone that high from one conspiracy uh, since. Uh, Timmons had several close calls uh, while he was down in uh, the uh, Grand Caymans. One day, just to give you one example, uh, they came to him and they said, Ned, we got to go for a ride. And he said, why? And he said, there's an FBI agent on the island. Well, he knew there was. He was one. And, no, but there was somebody that came on a cruise ship, and he had been identified by the people on the cruise ship as an FBI agent and warned him. So he was wondering, are they taking me out to shoot me because they know I'm the FBI agent or, you know, whatever. And then they told him about this guy on the cruise ship. So he had several brushes like that while he uh, uh, gained their trust posing as a security expert. Whoops. Kalish, on the meanwhile, had fallen in love with the daughter of a Secret Service agent from Tampa named Denise. And he at first uh, told her that he was an international banker. Later he admitted his illegal activities. He had strict rules for travel about, uh, he was, wanted his people to look very businesslike. They no traveling in blue jeans, no t-shirts. Uh, in a day when you didn't have laptops, carry a briefcase, uh, put on a jacket, no tie, but at least uh, appear to be uh, traveling on some sort of business and, and keep to yourself and things of that nature. That's how he looked when he was a high school drug yard, drug seller, and later 
he's cleaned up his act and he uh, was buying Lear jets. He actually bought a, uh, an airplane for the Panamanian Defense Force on time. He would make the payments and they would make, he bought the plane and then they made payments to him uh, for the plane. Uh, that, those payments were eventually forfeited to the U.S. government. But Kalish was left with uh, some money. Uh, Vogel, Rich, and Kalish were all uh, apprehended. Um, Vogel and, and Rich are on the Bureau of Presidents websites. Kalish served his entire sentence in a little jail in South Florida, uh, or Central Florida, that had uh, conjugal visits and he was a trustee and ran around and did things. Uh, he testified against uh, Noriega at trial, as did Rich. Uh, Rich was apprehended uh, uh, while he was leaving, well, he, he had left the Grand Caymans, he went to Jamaica to the wedding of uh, Heather Locklear and Tommy Lee and was actually in her presence with Tommy Lee and his date, Miss Columbia, uh, when he was taken into custody by the Jamaicans and then, and then put on a plane out of the country and turned over to us. Um, of course, you know that Noriega, uh, politically, this thing bubbled up. One day I got a call, you got to be in Washington tomorrow. Any clue as to what this is about? Well, I knew that Tampa didn't want us in the case and they wanted us out. I thought, are we getting tossed out? I've got the mayor of Atlantic Beach and a whole bunch of local people that I wanted to indict, but Tampa just didn't want us messing around because we, we were, you know, the country cousins compared to the big city boys. And, um, but no, the, it turned out that uh, the whole case had bubbled up to the National Security Council and Reagan made the final call. And he said, if he's indicted, if he's dirty, indict him. It was a simple Reagan-esque call that you would expect totally honest. So that pushed Noriega closer to Cuba and there were a lot of incidents that built up to um, the provo provocative actions that eventually led to the invasion. We've gotten a little press um, locally uh, about this but um, the, the only other thing I'll say about, about the uh, testimony is uh, Kalish testified several places, not only at the trial, but also to the uh, Senate on money laundering and uh, narco-terrorism or narco-trafficking narco by uh, state actors. And uh, that's a um, subcommittee on investigations of the Committee of Governmental Affairs for the, for the Senate. And um, we've attached that as an appendix to the book, not only to show that the book is true, but to show after you've read it and you read his testimony, you say, yeah, I saw everything he, mentioned, he mentions in the, in the book is in his, in his testimony. And also to show you what a clever guy Kalish was because he was served up softball questions by the senators, such as, Mr. Kalish, do you have any advice for the youth of America? So by the time he had finished testifying, he had U.S. senators eating out of his hands, giving him questions like that. So it kind of gives you an insight into the, uh, to the type, of, type of person it is. Um, we eventually in North Carolina uh, convicted uh, well over 105 to 10 people out of our, our case. We had only a few... Uh, people who were local, the former mayor of Atlantic Beach, the former, uh, the person who started the Net House restaurant, still owned by his family today in Beaufort, if any of you have been down, downtown Beaufort on the waterfront and go down there and see the Net House. Um, there's a martial arts instructor who's uh, getting his copy of the book today. Uh, he, he teaches martial arts in Moorhead City, taught it to the police department back then, still does. They all like the old boy. Bobby's a good old guy. Uh, there's a person that owned a, an alternator generator repair shop named Bugs Weatherington, who's local. And John Van Horn uh, was a little a gopher. He'd run the, run the lookout boats around and park them at different marinas and, and take care of details. And he owns the uh, Ice House restaurant. So now you know some of the places I don't go to eat when I'm down there. <laughs> but um, it, was, it was a pretty amazing time. Uh, at that time, as I've gone around eastern North Carolina to tell people in the coastal towns that I've written a book, I said, you ought to write about the one from our town, you know, and I said, maybe my next book I'll have to do an anthology of smuggling tales because every coastal community in, in North Carolina had, a, uh, uh, had a, a coastal smuggling ring of one type or another that was really, really renowned. Uh, just to show you that politics have been cleaned up considerably in North Carolina, the last sheriff of Brunswick County went to jail because of smuggling back in the 80s. His name was Herman Strong and um, he was the sheriff for a good long while. He was taking fifty thousand uh, dollars a load to make sure his deputies were on the wrong side of the county. 
Currently, the sheriff of Brunswick County, last sheriff of Brunswick County, is pending sentencing. His crime is lying to an FBI agent about whether or not his deputies were building yard signs while they were on the county clock. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's a little degree of corruption uh, that's, that's different. And I'm not minimizing uh, his use of, of political patronage people to, to do things like that. I'm just saying that there is a significant difference. And, and our institutions were really quite tried. There was a lot of uh, bribery and corruption. We had a number of those kinds of cases in our office. Uh, fish and wildlife uh, officers uh, uh, were prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office. At the time I was there, Sheriff Herman Strong, the Chief of Police of Shalot, Lieutenant from the Ocean Isle uh, Beach Police Department. Um, a number of deputy sheriffs uh, from uh, some uh, counties uh, in Sneeds Ferry to Onslow County deputy sheriffs provided a police escort for the marijuana that came in on uh, near Christmas of one year and you know, while it was being transported to a warehouse in, in uh, Newburn. Almost all of Sneeds Ferry was down at the water that day. The kids were playing in the water. It was unseasonably warm. Daddies were unloading marijuana. The wives were standing there watching. And a few years later, uh, about uh, three quarters of the, of the male population of Sneeds Ferry went to jail on two, two or three big buses that pulled up at the Onslow County Courthouse. Uh, to spend a couple of years at state time. So we had a, we had a, a, a lot of uh, uh, testing of the integrity of our system that um, really isn't put as often to the test today, even though we have a lo uh, corruption and it still happens in law enforcement. I think we weathered the worst of the storm. And um, crack dealers and crack just doesn't generate the kind of money that this did, we were bringing it in, they were bringing it in in multi-ton loads, you know, and uh, that's kind of hard to comprehend today when we uh, will have a press conference if we seize 500 pounds of marijuana. Back then it was just, you know, well, we seized 29,000 pounds and, and it was so common that at one, one time we had some uh, smugglers tell us, yeah, we brought it in and we were going to bring it in the night before, but uh, the Hatteras uh, Fishing Center was being used by somebody else. And they said, well, who were they? I don't know. And they live on Hatteras Island and, uh, and the Outer Banks. And there were so many smugglers, there were people there they didn't know that were using the Outer Banks for smuggling. And they brought it in and they had to loiter offshore one more day before they, they could bring it in. So um, that's all I have really about it. I have the, I have the book. Uh, if anybody's interested and would like to read the full story afterwards, I'll be glad to uh, uh, hang around, sign a few books. and. Uh, pocket a few coins, a few shekels for my. The book is twenty dollars, and um, it's available uh, online. We have a, a website called seaofgreedbook.com that has some of the the story about it, and you can order, pay with PayPal, and that type of thing. Uh, and it's in some of the local bookstores in the Moorhead, Beaufort area, and in in Manio, but uh, haven't been able to get it out yet. We've just been too busy. Question. <coughs> The guy from, uh, uh, who started the net house was named Stephen Fodry. His father was a, a Wake Forest graduate and a chef at the Harvey Mansion in Newburn. And uh, his family was from Moorhead City originally. His mother uh, and grandmother lived in Moorhead City. In fact, her house was mortgaged, his mother's house was mortgaged to start the net house. He was down in Atlanta in a bar partying. And he met Stephen Kalish there and found out that Kalish was a smuggler and he said, I can hook you up with a location that will really be good. You will really like it. It'll be a good place to bring drugs in. And that was going on all over the coast uh, at that time. Money. Money. <laughs> oh, money. It was very, very common uh, back then. If you dressed and acted and walked a certain way and hung out in certain places and you went in, people immediately suspected you of being a smuggler, whether you were or not. That's why a lot of the FBI agents and uh, SBI agents would do that and they'd get in conversations and one thing would lead to another. Many cases were made that way and many connections were made that way. Um, unfortunately, we had a corporal in the Marine Corps who was a pretty good smuggler. He got out of the Marine Corps and realized Wilmington would be a pretty good spot and he, he ran a very sophisticated organization uh, that we never caught him with any of the dope in his hand. Uh, but it, you know, we eventually unraveled it through a conspiracy type prosecution, but they were very successful in getting it in and getting the money. I think the money, in his instance, was what called attention to him. You know, when you 
pay $750,000 in cash, it kind of draws attention. But that, that was a very common thing back then. A very, very cooperative. We, we had a good working relationship with just about every one of the DA's offices. Uh, most of the DA's offices knew that usually these kinds of prosecutions were well above what they're manned and equipped to do. And um, the response by the state to this was to create an investigative grand jury, which is hardly ever used, but the statute is still on the books statutorily. But that statute was put on the books specifically to enable the state prosecutors to uh, take on some of these cases if they wished and give them a capability. Judge Don Stevens, um, who's the resident Superior Court judge, and who, uh, interesting enough, was my uh, replacement in the Marine Corps when I was uh, mustered off of active duty. He came in and took my spot as an instructor at Naval Justice School. Uh, Don was in the AG's office in special prosecutions, and they would typically be the people who would conduct those kinds of investigations, and they participated in, in some uh, of those. Uh, our governor used to be a working prosecutor and actually did some good when he was at, in that job. Uh, <laughs> I won't go any further than that. <laughs> had he only stayed. But um, nonetheless, uh, we had a pretty good working relationship with, with the DAs uh, at the time. Uh, with local police departments and sheriff's departments, it was... Um, sometimes less dependent on what our trust level was for that particular uh, agency. And some were good and some were not so good. The State Bureau of Investigation and the FBI, never any question. Uh, I don't know of a single SBI agent or a single uh, federal agent from this area that ever went south. Um, but state agencies, yes, a lot, quite a few. Tampa uh, had a prosecution of Kalish and Rich and Vogel just like I did and they prosecuted him on conspiracy. They had a few other Floridians that were involved in it. Um, the question was where was Noriega going to get prosecuted and Tampa wanted it very badly. We had no shot in that because nothing, we didn't have a conspiratorial act even that, that could have been done because they had made all their money. The conspiracy was basically over with the Eastern District of North Carolina. They just had all this money that came from here that had to go into to, uh, to that. And eventually Miami was selected as the, uh, as the venue for prosecution, figuring that they had the most conspiratorial acts. And also I think that uh, Maine Justice had a lot more confidence in the people in Miami who were on the trial team and the U.S. Attorney than they did those folks in Tampa. Uh, I explained more about some of their bizarre behavior from an in, insider turf fighting type thing than, um, but they were almost like they didn't really want it to work. Doug, were you ever at risk? Not from this group. Uh, th they never had any, I carried a gun in that era, era and was a, uh, when, until I uh, left the U.S. Attorney's Office actually, uh, was a special deputy U.S. Marshal, so I could. could. Um, this group didn't directly threaten me. There were some folks from down in Columbus County that uh, I was a little concerned about. I wouldn't, I'll go riding down there today, but not back then. <clears throat> not without a squad of Marines or a few, a few other agents. Were there any North Carolina bank money laundering uh, issues that came up in this event? No, no. Uh, and remember, um, when I talked about the penalties, most of the Reagan era reforms came well after these smugglers and, and made it tighter on them. You know, at the time we were doing this, you did not have a thing called a currency monetary instrument report that you'd have to file when you take money across state borders. Uh, lawyers didn't take, uh, uh, could take cash and not have to report uh, on a Form 9300, uh, trader business uh, receipts of $10,000 or more. So none of that was, uh, was here. Um, Back in that day, and this was before I got the U.S. Attorney's Office, so I've heard this, uh, a, uh, but it was heard, heard it from people who were there. Um, they were trying a group of smugglers from Miami here in, uh, in Newburn, and uh, one of the smugglers thought the lawyers were doing such a good job, he brought in a box of, bol of uh, Rolex watches on Monday morning and gave everybody a tip of a Rolex watch. One of our enterprising attorneys here uh, realized there was a woman's watch in there as well, and he said, oh, my wife would love one too. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> he brought her home a little bauble. 
but um, there w it was very lax. There was no money laundering laws. Uh, there were, uh, the penalties were just the statutory set penalties. We didn't have uh, structured sentencing that we have today. All of, 29,000 pounds would get you life today. Back then it might get you five, six years, unless you're at the top of the food chain, it might get you 10 or 12. And uh, you really had to fight to get that. The bail laws were pretty loose. You had a monetary bail. You didn't have uh, detain or not detain, which is the, uh, the federal rule. So uh, you can see how people would say, gee, if I get caught, I might get three years at my level, and yet I can get $50,000 in 1982 dollars buying power. Uh, that would be worth about five times that much, I imagine, today. So, you know, would, what would people do for $250,000, you know, today? I mean, that's what you have to put yourself in, in the frame of. Denton may just indict the former sheriff of Robinson County. He's been convicted and sentenced to prison. 28 deputies? Uh, not 28, but about 12 of his deputies. They were robbing people on the highway and committing home invasions. They were pretty, pretty much out of control down there in Robson County. Is there a reference in one of the slides to a possible movie? Uh, we have, I've been approached to by some people who would like to, to make a movie of it, and they've done a draft screenplay. I mean, you know, that's like being on the beach and lightning striking where you are. You know, yeah, maybe, who knows. It's a better movie. What I do say about it, though, the movie, is this is a better story than Blow. If you take the, if anybody saw Blow, Blow is a common <clears throat> garden variety story of a person involved in drugs who has some success. You take a guy that has nothing, he goes to Hollywood, he hooks up with some people in the California area, cocaine hits just about the time they're in, involved in it. They made a tremendous amount of money, uh, almost unbelievable. They had a house, you know, stacked with money. Well, these people had the same thing. Uh, at the end, however, he cannot refrain from staying in that business even when the business has changed. He was in the, in the era when they flew in loads on, on cowboy pilots who would run, run low, fly high, run low, come in and pop up in the United States and go somewhere and unload. And we used to have a lot of that in eastern North Carolina too. Right after the boat smuggling stopped, that's what they went to. But the military had pretty well shut that down with the over-horizon radar. And the, that era went also. He didn't realize that. He wasn't that smart. And he kept trying to do the same thing, and he was dealing with undercover agents. And at the end of the movie, you see him tending the warden's garden. He's going to be there the rest of his natural life. In our case, Stephen Kalish was left with some assets by the government at the time it was, uh, the case was over, basically because we had no way of repatriating the assets in Panama itself. So he was left with a Mm, $750,000, $800,000 condo in downtown Panama City and its contents uh, when he got out of jail. And um, he is nowhere to be seen today. You will not find him anywhere. There's different rumors that he was institutionalized once in Mexico by some people, but um, I don't believe those. I think those are rumors that Kalish himself uh, put out as disinformation. So whatever happened to Denise? Denise stayed... Denise, Denise, Denise and he stayed married through the whole time he was in, in prison. Uh, she visited him regularly. She went, back to, she went to college while he was uh, going to stay at home in Tampa and uh, got married. And, uh, well, they stayed married. And uh, when he was released, that's when he vanished. And he and Denise are somewhere. I guess everybody's somewhere, but I don't know where they are. And they were left with a considerable amount of assets to be somewhere with. So. Uh, to me, that's a better story than Blow, where I know where the guy was. He's in, he's in New York. Anytime I want to go to the, see him, I can go to that prison. <laughs> well, I was a handsome young man then. They just have to pick a handsome young actor. Maybe, maybe Jag, the guy who plays Jag, would, has that clean-cut image. So that would be all right with me. My wife has already picked out Matthew McConaughey for the uh, role of Kalish. Because uh, he's uh, pretty easy on the eyes, she says. Not a good judge of that. And he's from Houston. And uh, Kalish was from Houston. And his character has to kind of grow during the course of the, of the movie. It, it might be hard for McConaughey. He's kind of a wooden actor, I think, you know. But. Columbus County? I was the prosecutor in a, a series of corruption cases called Columbus County Corruption, or Cold Corps for short. 
we almost got to uh, Lieutenant Governor Green in, the, in that case. Uh, uh, the state did try to take a crack at him. I declined that case because I didn't think it was winnable. And uh, he, it was a technical violation of the bribery statute in that he agreed to accept. And he did agree to accept. But he did not accept. He, he smelled a rat. And he wouldn't take the money in the end. Uh, and the, the FBI was real hinky back then about giving money to a public official on the first time they met him. And the undercover agent wanted to do it, but they had a control group in headquarters that wouldn't let him do it. And, uh, and if he had paid Green the money that first meeting took place, Green would have accepted and thought that's what a criminal does. But when you try to act like a criminal while you've got a committee thinking like, how does a criminal think, it doesn't really work. And uh, you, have, you have to trust your undercover agents or not. But uh, Green. But I prosecuted Green later. I convicted him in 1996 for tax evasion. And um, he didn't go to prison at that time, but he was put on house arrest and he died a felon. But um, the... Uh, what about Green and his son and the burning of warehouses? Well, there, his son was convicted in federal court in Tennessee of burning one of the warehouses. I prosecuted in Cold Corps the man who was his arsonist who was convicted of burning Monk Harrington's warehouse down for somebody else, not for Green. And we know he was his arsonist because he admitted to us, I've done that for him. But I'll never say that in court is also what he said because you can get killed doing that. And yes, I, care. I, I would not go into Columbus County in that era if I wasn't armed and had some people with me who were armed who were also good shots because those folks were dangerous down there at that particular time. I think it's safer now. I'm not sure, but I think. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned the uh, reduced instances of large seizures of, of drugs, I guess, in the area. Uh, has, in fact, the importation and consumption of drugs decreased since the 80s, or has it remained constant or increased, do you know? I don't really know the actual statistics, uh, so I, I, can't, I can't say to that. I know that the role of our area has changed as smuggling techniques have changed. And smugglers are very adaptable, you know. When they see something is not going to work, they'll switch to another uh, track and, and try something else. And when that doesn't work, they'll switch to something else. I, I do know uh, at this point the largest uh, source of drugs for the United States is the Mexican border. And they come across the Mexican border. It's a training uh, normally new drug assistant U.S. attorneys are taken to the Mexican border on a field trip so they can get an appreciation. Uh, and they, they take them to the customs uh, areas at one of the large border crossings. And you stand there behind maybe 15 to 20 uh, entrance lanes to the United States with something like 40 or 50,000 cars coming through there per day, cars or vehicles, trucks. And, you, and you've got two people per booth and one uh, dog handler for every five booths. And you say, um, this is where the war on drugs is. This is where they come in. Occasionally you'll read about a tunnel uh, and whatnot. They still do boat smuggling, but different. They leave in open boats from Columbia and they head to the California shore across open ocean uh, in fairly large go fast pipe boats. Uh, uh, fountains or Donzies or something of that nature can carry about 2,000 pounds more or less. Two guys, lots of fuel, and you run as fast as you can and hope the Coast Guard doesn't see you. And that's pretty much what they do. Or they go from Colombia and go a different route and come to Puerto Rico. And once they get in Puerto Rico, they've cleared customs. It's no longer a customs. That's where the United States Customs is. So then any shipments from, cust from Puerto Rico to the United States are domestic. And it's easier to conceal product in a domestic shipment. And um, uh, the agency that does the monitoring and detecting for that is in Key West. It, uh, it's a joint interagency type thing. And they do the monitoring and detecting. And I used to have reserve Marines who drilled there. So I've actually been in there and seen what they do. And, you know, and, and uh, it's a high tech gee whiz type place and, and everything. But that's pretty much the kind of smuggling that goes on today in large amounts. Occasionally hear of a ship's crew member or somebody on a ship's crew that they'll, uh, I mean, they'll always turn somebody for anything. If I can get 20 kilos in through you because you're a cook on a ship, I'll do it, you know. 
But um, when we're talking multi-tons and, and uh, things of that nature, you're going to have to try and get it across in bulk. And it's much more efficient for them to have a decoy vehicle breaks down and, you know, or gets caught at the border and everybody comes out and arrests the people on the decoy vehicle and then everybody else is on. Come on, get through, wave them through. And then you come in with a tractor trailer that's loaded in some concealed fashion, whether it's in a load of furniture or it's a, uh, a tanker, and then only part of the tanker is filled for the regular product and the other part is filled with, with cocaine, and you bring it in that way in bulk. I mean, so there's a lot of different techniques that they'll try to use, and we're successful about, I guess, the same percentage of success as we had back then, about 10 to 15 percent, and then the rest of it gets in. I don't think so. I think their integrity issues have, have been cleaned up. But back at that time, uh, yeah, there were a lot of uh, Coast Guardsmen. Uh, we prosecuted a number of them here in North Carolina. Even though they came from the Isla Mirada Station, they were selling the drugs back here. through. They were from Brunswick County. So they, they were in the Coast Guard. They were down there on these, the go-fast boats. And one of our SBI agents had a picture of Vice President Bush and all these young Coast Guardsmen standing around. And then he had X's drawn through all the ones that got prosecuted, you know, and, um, and whatnot. They had the new toys but they didn't have uh, adult supervision. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's li literally true. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a former Marine, but, you know, retired, but they had 18, 19-year-old kids uh, with go-fast interceptors running around at night, and you might have 20 of them, and they had one officer overseeing all of them, one staff NCO overseeing all of them, and they never left the station and didn't go on the boats and didn't go on the raids. Um, so it was left to the kids to decide what they wanted to do. And some of them would get the idea, well, why should we turn all of it in, you know? We'll, we can be a hero and turn in this much. And that's pretty much what happened back, back then. It was, like I say, lack of adult supervision. Judge, I don't mean to get all libertarian on you, but is it all worth it? Well, it depends. I mean, you know, that's a judgment call that society has to make, you know? Uh, you, I do like the scene in traffic where the guy says, uh, you know, why are you picking on me? I'm just one little cocaine smuggler. You got me with my truckload. You're losing this war on drugs. Uh, and they lean across the table and say, yeah, we're losing the war. But I tell you what, we won the battle when it comes to you. What are you going to do? And i uh, made that speech many times myself. I believe in the battle on, on the war on drugs because I think it's bad for the American public. It's, bad, uh, it's, it's a bad thing to be uh, infested with drugs. Do we need to do more to battle it? on many fronts? Probably so. But I would certainly not be the one who would stand up and say that I want to have drugs sold openly and freely in the United States to any adult that wants to buy it. Uh, the only country that has flirted with that really is Holland with their pot houses and the police in Holland will tell you that that's a bad idea, that that really is not good and they're trying to restrict it and to regulate it in their Dutch way uh, because it society uh, wise has not proven to be a really good thing. What it has attracted to Holland is every drag from every other country comes dragging in there so they can smoke pot in their places without being harassed and then the, their state ends up having, their country ends up having to support those folks under the European socialism and it's becoming to be, be a financial burden that they really don't want to assume. So I think you'd have a much more unproductive society if you had uh, wide open borders for drugs and, don't know how much extra tax money it would take to cure all that. This, um, on your uh, photos, you mentioned that uh, somebody had, um, a, one of the drug dealers, had some kind of a machine that kind of tested somebody's mood to see if they were. Voice stress. Voice stress, Voice stress analysis stress. is what the machine was called. Yeah, I think it's hocus pocus. I don't believe well, in that. If it worked for them, wouldn't it work for us? Well, the CIA obviously uses these things, and they have people that they believe might, you know, be able to do. They use every kind of scientific, you know, our intelligence community uses those kinds of things at certain levels. Might and um, enough to just shake but up to give themselves up. Well, themselves in away. well, the, the CIA regularly polygraphs, and so does the FBI at the higher levels. They polygraph, and and most law enforcement agencies do have a lot more faith in polygraph as an investigative tool and it'll do the same thing the voice stress analysis does puts you in the same fear box in fact it will put you 
they will show you a test. They'll do a test before you take the, the test, which will actually show you that the machine works. Therefore, when you go into the test, you know the reliability of the machine because it's already proven it'll work on you. And then that will shake you up a whole lot more than holding some device and saying, talk into the box and I can tell you if you're <laughs> lying or not. You know, Sounds like the Wizard of Oz to me. Oh, I think the Mexicans are uh, as vicious as the Colombians ever thought about being. Um, how that, the real intricacies of how the Colombians and the Mexicans have made peace, because they were really at loggerheads back in the day I was a prosecutor. The Mexicans were trying to get into the drug trade, and all our success in shutting down waterborne smuggling and airborne smuggling forced them to work with the Mexicans because now the Mexicans had the only land bridge into the United States. It's like they're standing on their side of the border saying, <coughs> pay us, you know? And because of the money that they're able to extract, because now the Colombians sell to the Mexicans and the Mexicans have taken over the task of transportation. So if the Colombians can get it out of Colombia, they're actually, their job is easier. And we do track lots and lots of flights that go into Mexico straight from Colombia which we know drugs are aboard the planes that are coming in there, the small craft, aircraft, based on where the flight originates and where it's terminating. So we know those are drug flights, and the Mexicans do absolutely nothing to stop it because of corruption within their country. And then they uh, 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 transport it, and the Mexicans have taken over the difficult task, really, from the Colombians, because the Colombians now get it from Colombia to Mexico, we get paid. That's pretty easy. And the Mexicans got the hard part, but they've got huge profits and because of those huge profits that's where the violence and corruption comes in and uh, the Colombians are still making good money they're just not having to work quite as hard <laughs> Judge, let's get a last question or so okay like I think that pretty much ran the gamut there so okay. I'm through if everybody else is <laughs> like I said I will hang around and sell you some books